the second presentation of the session is from Dr. Chandra Tsla. The title is Genetics in Proposes and Epigenetic Imposes. Please enjoy. Hello everyone, I'm Sohel from Dr. Chandak's lab. Genetics proposes epigenetic imposer. So our lab focuses on the understanding of genetics and the epigenetic basis of complex diseases. First, Sara is going to give you a small introduction on how we are going to interact. Then we'll move on to the other things. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sara, a PhD student from Dr. Chandak's lab. Hope all of you are as excited to attend this session as we are to interact with you. We don't want this to be a one-way street. So we have come up with a few ways to enable you to interact with us throughout the sessions. There is a lot of information we want to share with you, but we have limited time. If you are interested in knowing more about a topic, you can use any QR code scanner to scan the QR code on our slides, and this will lead you to more high level elaborate information on that particular topic. You can also take a picture or a screenshot of the QR code to check it out later. Don't worry if you miss out on a QR code. You can put up a request in the chat box and we will give them to you at the end of the session. Apart from this, a fun way of interacting over the web is through Mentimeter. We will be conducting polls and quizzes through this. To participate in a poll or quiz, type www.menti.com and enter the code you see on the screen, as is underlined in red in this image. You can then start answering the questions on your phone. There will be such polls, quizzes and QR codes throughout the talk, so all of you out there, interact with us, be attentive and enjoy the talk. Let's give this a try by beginning the session with a poll. So we'll continue with the poll. So what will happen? Good morning, everyone. I'm Sara, a PhD student from Dr. Go to menti.com as we start the poll. So type the code. And you can start the poll. the QR code on our slides and this will lead you to more high level elaborate information on that particular topic. You can also take a picture or a screenshot of the QR code to check it out later. Don't worry if you miss out on a QR code. You can put up a request in the chat box and we will give them to you at the end of the session. Apart from this, a fun way of interacting over the web is through Mentimeter. We will be conducting polls and quizzes through this. To participate in a poll or quiz, type www.menti.com and enter the code you see on the screen, as is underlined in red in this image. You can then start answering the questions on your phone. There will be such polls, quizzes and QR codes throughout the talk, so all of you out there, interact with us, be attentive and enjoy the talk. Let's give this a try by beginning the session with a poll. to interact with us throughout the sessions. There is a lot of information we want to share with you, but we have limited time. 
If you are interested in knowing more about a topic, you can use any QR so why do you scanner think, to scan the QR code the on this? our slides. And this will lead you to more high level elaborate information on that particular topic. You can also take a picture or a screenshot of the QR code to check it out later. Don't worry if you miss out on a QR code. You can put up a request. Right, all of them. So let us try to understand why we are able to, uh, why is it all of them? So our lab's larger goal is to have a comprehensive knowledge on gene nutrition and gene environment interactions. But to understand that first, we need to familiarize with the idea of genes, monogenic disorders, and complex diseases. So Swati will walk us, walk us through what genes are and how they work. work. Genes play an important role in determining physical traits, how we look, curly or straight hair, long or short legs, even how you might smile or laugh. Many of these characteristics are passed from one generation to the next in a family by genes. Genes aren't just found in humans, but all animals and plants have genes too. Each cell in the human body contains about 25,000 to 35,000 genes. You will be surprised to know that your genes are 98% similar to that of chimpanzees and 92% similar to that of mice. What's even more mind-blowing is that your DNA is only 0.1% different than any other human being living on earth. The DNA of all human beings in the world is 99.9% .9 similar to each other and only 0.1% of difference makes you who you are. So where are these important genes are located? Well, they are so small you can't see them. Genes are found on thread-like structures called chromosomes and chromosomes are found inside the nucleus of the cell. Your body is made up of billions of cells. Cells are very small units that can make up all living things. A cell is so tiny that you can only see it using a powerful microscope. But how do genes work? The basic pathway which a gene follows is gene first converted to RNA and this RNA converts into a protein. This is called as central dogma of life. Genes can be compared to words, like words are made up of alphabets arranged in a particular order. To make sense, genes are made up of bases arranged in a particular order. Your genes are responsible for different features of your body, for example, the color of your eyes, your height, the shape of your nose, your blood group, and also certain diseases. In a single individual, genes for all traits occur in pairs called alleles. For example, if you have two alleles that determine your eye color, you get one allele from your mother and the other from your father. This is why your features are similar to that of your parents. Your parents receive their genes from their parents and that's what they pass on to you. So, you also resemble your grandparents. When words are put together, they
gives you some information. Genes also collectively carry instructions for the cell, much like a recipe for a dish. Even a single letter error can change the meaning of the instruction. For example, if the chef writes a recipe as put half a bin of pineapples instead of half a tin of pineapples, it means two different things. Similarly, even if a single base change is made within a gene, it can sometimes change how the gene functions. Such changes in the genetic code are called mutations. These variations are responsible for the differences you see in hair type, skin color, height and several other such traits among the different people. These variations could also be the causes of diseases. How are these mutations are studied? To know more about how these mutations are studied, please scan the QR code. So some diseases are caused by mutations only in a single gene. These are called monogenic diseases such as sickle cell anemia. A person having sickle cell anemia has deformed red blood cells that do not work properly. This happens due to a single mutation in the beta globin gene. A person gets this disease if he or she of the disease allele of the beta globin gene from both their parents. Children having sickle cell anemia need regular blood transfusion. They suffer a lot and often do not even survive till adulthood. If a child receives even one healthy allele from any of their parents, they are carriers but do not get the disease. In one project of our lab, we are checking this gene in children from Chhattisgarh and Maharashtra to find if they have mutation that cause this disease. By checking this gene in the population, we can find the people who are carrying the disease gene. Once we know about these people, we inform them about it and advise them about their options so that they do not get a child having the disease. More about this project will be spoken about in a later session. We can also test the genes of a baby for this disease in early days of pregnancies. Most of the variations in the gene can be diagnosed. And many of these diagnostic tests are also done by CCMB if samples come through doctors. I hope you people understood the basics of genetics told to you all by Swati. I will be continuing on a monogenic disorder that we are working upon in our lab. I will be talking to you all about the CSIR sickle cell anemia mission. So let us begin with a brief introduction to the disease. Sickle cell anemia or sickle cell disease is a disease of the red blood cells that causes distorted shape of the RBCs. As mentioned by my colleagues previously, it is a monogenic disorder which means the disease is caused by a change or a mutation in a single gene. It is also an autosomal recessive disorder which indicates that the gene is located on a non-sex chromosome and that both mutated copies should be inherited from, for an individual to be affected. The types of hemoglobin a person makes in the RBCs depends on what hemoglobin genes are inherited from his or her parents. When both parents have sickle cell trait, a child has a 25% chance of sickle cell disease, 25% do not carry any sickle cell allele, and 50% of them have heterozygous condition. The gene defect is a single nucleotide mutation in the beta globin gene where a GAG codon changes to GTG which results in glutamic acid being substituted by valin at position 6. The gene is present on the long arm of the 11th chromosome in humans. Hemoglobin with this mutation is referred to as HbS, as opposed to the normal adult hemoglobin which is known as HbA. This is normally a benign mutation causing no apparent effects on the secondary, tertiary or quaternary structures of hemoglobin under normal oxygen concentration. However, under low oxygen concentration, HBS polymerizes and forms fibrous precipitates because the deoxy form of hemoglobin exposes a hydrophobic patch on the protein. In people heterozygous for HBS, that is carriers of sickle hemoglobin, the polymerization problems are minor because the normal allele can produce half of the hemoglobin. In people homozygous for HBS, the presence of long chain polymers of HBS distort the shape of the red blood cells from a smooth donut-like shape 
to ragged and full of spikes making it fragile and susceptible to breaking within the capillaries carriers of symptoms only if they are deprived of oxygen for example while climbing a mountain or when severely dehydrated the most common symptoms of fca patients are pain crisis swelling and pains in hands and feet paler fatigue anemia and leg ulcers in some severe cases eye damage lung and heart damage or aseptic necrosis and bone infarcts may also occur the most common requirement of these patients are blood transfusions let us have a look at the distribution of sickle cell anemia in india the prevalence of this disease is mostly seen as a belt across the central part of india including regions such as parts of maharashtra and gujarat madhya pradesh chatisgarh jharkhand and odisha as a part of the project so far we have screened approximately 3 lakh individuals of which the distribution of carriers is about 5 to 10% and those of the affected individuals is about 0.2 to 0.4% approximately the csir sickle cell anemia mission it is a multi pronged project to screen for sickle cell patients and carriers treat the affected individuals and counsel them the screening is conducted in areas with high prevalence of the disease like chatisgarh maharashtra madhya pradesh pradesh and jharkhand prenatal and neonatal screenings are also conducted as a part of the project prenatal screening is testing whether the unborn child is affected with the disease and neonatal screening is screening the newborn babies of high risk patients where both parents are either carriers or affected for the presence of the mutated gene identification of neonates at an early age helps in the better management of the disease and a better quality of life CCMB also acts as a nodal center for other labs that are involved in multiple other strategies for treatment and cure of the disease. A whole genome sequencing study will be conducted on the patients to study the heterogeneity of the disease. A proteomic study is also being conducted to identify novel biomarkers indicating the status of the disease. Screening and counseling. Here are some images of the screenings being conducted in schools and colleges. A preliminary solubility test is conducted and the samples of people who are positive are collected for further investigations. After confirmation, the family members are also called, tested and counseled. Health checkup and follow-up camps. Regular health checkup and follow-up camps are organized to examine the health status of the patients and to see their response to the treatment. Camps are also organized at remote villages that are likely to have high numbers of FCA cases. to spread awareness about the disease this is our team that conducts screening and counseling at chatisgarh and our team conducting screening and counseling at maharashtra this is our team from ccmb that conducts molecular tests manages the data and facilitates the smooth functioning of the activities being conducted at the sample collection centers and other labs involved We have designed a portal to enter and manage clinical data of the screened carriers and patients the demographic data vaccination records growth and development data present complaints past history treatment plans and other investigations in lab reports at regular time intervals are recorded a total of 1 1529 patients and carriers entries have been made so far let us have a look at the social impact of the mission Molecular tests for prenatal screening for SCA, neonatal screening for SCA and screening adults for SCA are conducted under the project. The patients are provided with hydroxyurea tablets, pain medication, vitamin supplements and special vaccines for the management of their symptoms. The carriers, patients and family members are counseled for treatment, management and prevention of further spread of the disease. We have also developed the cost and time effective method for the molecular diagnosis of the disease. For the better understanding and consideration of the common people, the Chhattisgarh team has designed a sickle kundli to be matched before getting married so that the inheritance of the sickle gene is restricted. This is all about a monogenic disorder. My colleague Sohel will be briefing you all about complex diseases now. Hi, I'm Sohel, a PhD student from Dr. Chandak's lab. Now that you are familiar with the idea of genetic diseases, what about diseases like diabetes, obesity, and Alzheimer's? 
In diseases like diabetes, along with genetics, lifestyle and environment also contribute to the disease. Such diseases are called complex diseases. Let's compare monogenic and complex diseases. In monogenic diseases like sickle cell anemia, a single gene is a major contributor to the disease. Whereas in complex diseases, multiple genes along with environmental factors contribute to the disease. What is the role of environment? Your genes along with your lifestyle and environment makes you, well, you. Factors such as sleep, climate, nutrition, smoking, drinking, exercise, pollution, all contribute to your overall health and disease. Gene and environment together affect your phenotype. Let's see an example. In an experiment, fruit flies were grown in different temperatures. It was seen that flies grown at 17 degrees Celsius were larger compared to flies grown at 25 degrees Celsius. This shows that environment does affect us. To understand complex diseases, let's take a look at diabetes. Diabetes is a disease that occurs when your blood glucose is too high. Diabetes is influenced by both genetics and environment. It is known that over 400 genetic variants are linked with diabetes. Despite that, we are unable to completely explain the heritability and progression of the disease. Along with genetics, environment also plays a role. So, in diabetes, factors such as nutrition, stress, exercise, smoking, alcohol, etc. influence the progression of disease. But, how do genetics and environment interact? The answer is epigenetics. Epigenetics is roughly translated to in addition to genetics. To understand epigenetics better, imagine the cell as a restaurant. DNA is the recipe book containing all the recipes. Recipes are equivalent to my genes. RNA is the chef, protein is the dish and environment is my customer. The chef doesn't cook all the dishes but only the ones ordered. So epigenetic marks are like orders in the restaurant. They decide which recipes are to be cooked. Epigenetic regulations include RNA interference, histone modifications and post-translational modifications along with DNA methylation. Out of these, our lab mainly works with DNA methylation. Think of DNA methylation like road blockades. They do not allow gene to express by making the sequence inaccessible. These DNA methylation marks can be created as early as when the baby is still in the womb. This concept is known as DOHAD. DOHAD stands for Developmental Origins of Health and Disease. This concept suggests that environment such as Intrauterine environment can influence the baby's health throughout its life. So the factors such as mother's nutrition or mother's health can affect the future life of the baby. The potential for maternal nutrition to both alter offspring DNA methylation and influence phenotype is famously illustrated by the Agouti mouse experiments. Two groups of pregnant mice were fed diets that only Deferred in one carbon nutrients like folic acid, choline, betaine, and B12. Increased levels of one carbon nutrients increased methylation in the pups in the upstream region of the agouti gene, the gene responsible for fur color. The degree of expression of agouti gene dependent on the level of methylation, and this in turn altered the pups' fur color as well as their appetite, adiposity and glucose tolerance in adulthood. So, both genetics and epigenetics are involved in the progression of disease. So far, we understood that how the gene and environment interaction influence our traits and lifestyle. Not only undernutrition, but overnutrition also has adverse effects. We now are trying to understand the effect of other vitamins and nutrition during pregnancy on child's health, especially how maternal nutrition affects the behavior of her child's gene. We are now also beginning to explore how the early life environment of the child 
affects their brain development and cognitive abilities. Let's see how we study complex diseases in our lab. We begin with isolation of DNA from the blood samples of the individuals received from collaborative hospitals. To identify the DNA variations, we use molecular biology techniques such as PCR, polymerase chain reaction and high throughput technologies such as microarray technology and pyrosequencing. Microarray is a chip based technology where large numbers of genetic and epigenetic variations can be studied. After getting the information from this experiment, we analyze and study the association of gene variations with the disease or the traits with the help of bioinformatics and biostatistics. To know more about our lab and our work, please scan the QR code. Genes are the stretches of DNA. I hope now you understand how genetics and epigenetics both play a role in our disease. Now, let's see how much you understood. So, now it's quiz time. So this is how it is going to go. So you have to go to go. You'll have to go to menti.com and you'll have to type the code above. And then after enough participants have joined, we'll start the quiz. And remember, the person who gives the right answer first gets the highest points. Ready and stay sharp, the quiz is going to start. the answer is alleles. Okay, 
kind of bought the beef. Adela Fink. epigenetics because identical twins will have the same genetics. So the right answer is 25. This one for probability.
obesity, diabetes, and hypertension are all forms of disease because even environment and lifestyle plays a role. So the winner is Hansen. Congratulations. So I hope you understood how both genetics and environment are responsible for the progression of disease. ಲೀಡ್ Okay, so there were many questions which have been asked. Uh, we first start with the question that was about DNA fingerprinting. So the question was, uh, why do fingerprints? question okay the, the question was about dna fingerprinting so dna, DNA fingerprinting is mainly used for the forensic purpose actually so uh, what we do in the dna fingerprinting is we identify short repeats of dna which are used to identify the individual so this is very uh, it's a very common practice in the forensic uh, science uh, for the purpose of the foren uh, uh, forensic studies And the best example you can take is uh, when they when some custom people come across some animal skin but they don't know whether the skin is actual or artificial they take uh, advantage of dna fingerprinting uh, scientists also use the dna fingerprinting in the cases where there has been a natural calamity or some terrorist attack where the identity identity of the individual is can't be recognized just from the morphology so there they use the uh, uh, samples uh, blood samples or other samples to identify the individual uh, and that's how dna fingerprinting is used then there was another question about uh, why do fingerprints are different in human beings so uh, from i think from all, all this uh, during this session you might have uh, understood that uh, our many of the features of our body are uh, decided by the genetic architecture so dna fingerprinting uh, sorry not the dna fingerprint but your hands fingerprints are also dependent on the genetic architecture and it is suggested that uh, these fingerprints are not the result of a single gene but it's an interaction of multiple genes which contribute their own uh, on their own to decide the pattern of the dna uh, of the fingerprints then there was a question about dohart so dohart uh, it's a short term for developmental origin of health and diseases so this is an hypothesis which suggests that uh, if there is any abnormal exposure to the child in mother's womb it will have long term negative effect on the health of the child and this uh, long term effect can be can can be till the adulthood so when we see that individuals who are suffering from diabetes or obesity these are the individuals whose mothers were either uh, obese or they were suffering from diabetes and that's how they also become obese or, or diabetic during adulthood then there was a question about uh, whether the genetic disease can can be cured or not or are there any cure available for the genetic diseases so the simple answer is yes and no the for yes it's like cure is available but it's so expensive that uh, the normal individuals can't afford it uh, for example uh, there is a injection uh, for uh, spinal mus muscular atrophy which is sma and you might have come across this come in news and where people are asking for the uh, uh, fund raising for the vaccination the reason being the cost of this cure is 16 crore and 
the individuals can't afford that uh, exorbitant price. So the bus deaths, uh, they are possible to prevent the spread of uh, genetic diseases through screening and genetic counseling, which can be done uh, prior to the marriage between two individuals. Then there was a question about when do cells duplicate their DNA? So when a cell needs to proliferate, when it, it, it duplicates its DNA and it, then it divides into daughter cells. So these daughter cells will have the exact copy of the parent cell. And this is the way that uh, we all come into existence. And that's how we grow from childhood to adulthood. And that is how we maintain our uh, life, healthy life. Then there was a question about are X and Y chromosomes similar to autosomes? Uh, in terms of size, no, because X and uh, Y chromosomes are different. They have a different size. But in terms of genes, yes, they also have the genes which, uh, which play important role in the physiology of an individual. Then there was a question about beta globulin gene. Beta globulin gene is a gene that codes for a protein uh, which, which is a component of your hemoglobin. So hemoglobin, we all know, it's a, uh, uh, it's a part of our uh, red blood cells. And uh, it is very important for the uh, oxygen transport. Uh, then there was a question about uh, uh, hydroxyurea therapy. So hydroxyurea is, it's, we can call it as a medicine, which is used to treat the sickle cell anemia patient. Uh, this, uh, we will not say the treatment, but it, uh, it helps us to manage the symptoms of the sickle cell patients. And it is also uh, how it does, there are a few, few observations where one of the observations suggests that it increases the fetal hemoglobin. And this fetal hemoglobin has a very good efficiency for the oxygen. And the last question is, uh, who is likely to get the sickle cell anemia? So sickle cell anemia is inherited from the parents since it's a genetic disease. So either if, if, either, if either of the parent are disease or carrier, the ch children are going to get the disease. So I think we have answered all the questions. I hope you all have enjoyed your session. Um, if you have any more queries, you can directly write to us. We'll be very uh, glad to answer any of your queries. Thank you.